You're listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore and you're listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa and Eurosport. It's just me today. My colleagues Daniel Freib and Lionel Burney are beavering away on our final Friends special of 2016. Full Circle, the Bradley Wiggins story. And that will be out any day now, if indeed it's not out already. Today we're going to hear a conversation that I had earlier this year with Graham O'Brien, the great Scotsman, a living legend. He was in town to promote his new film, Battle Mountain, which follows his attempt at the world land speed record, a quintessential Abri project on his own homemade machine, of course. It was a qualified success, as he tells us, but we, we talk about that and we talk about other things. For those of you who are not familiar with Graham O'Brien's story, and I'm sure most of you are, uh, but it's covered in harrowing detail in his autobiography, uh, The Flying Scotsman, harrowing because as well as his great success as a Brie, um, has battled his whole life really with mental health problems. He also, during his cycling career, ran into real obstacles put in his way by uh, the UCI, um, by the professional team that he signed for, who wanted him to uh, sign up to a, a doping program. Um, and those battles, those struggles make uh, for uh, a, a story that's hard to read at times, but um, incredibly compelling um, and it was made into a film as well of course also called The Flying Scotsman but Aubrey was uh, our record holder twice he was a world pursuit champion twice he's most famous for that first our record he was 27 years old um, he'd been battling for a few years with Chris Boardman on busy British roads as part of the the time trial scene Boardman of course in 92 became the world, uh, sorry, the Olympic pursuit champion, and that seemed to spur Aubrey on and realize, make him realize, I suppose, what he was capable of. And in 1993, he went to Norway to attack uh, the world hour record, which was held at the time by the great Francesco Moser, you know, one of the real giants of the sport, set in Mexico City in 1984. Uh, Aubrey went out to Norway with his homemade bike which had, of course, washing machine parts, Old Faithful. He also had a, a, a new model of that bike, a, a replica supplied by one of his sponsors. And on the first day there, he had a go at the air record and just fell narrowly short on this replica bike. He was convinced that he could get up again the next morning and actually break it. Nobody else seemed uh, very confident in his ability to do that. But remarkably, he did. He got up the, early the next morning and having narrowly fallen short the day before actually broke Moser's hour record and that really propelled him to international stardom he went on from that to his world pursuit titles and once a boardman um broke a breeze hour record uh a Bree then re- wrestled it back the following year uh, so we talk a little bit about some of the aspects of a breeze career at where he is now um whether he's happy and we talk a little bit about of course his uh his recent trip to nevada and attempt at the world land speed record which as i mentioned is a sort of quintessential brie project the film shows him building the machine at his home in ayrshire in this kitchen using old bits of pots and pans and everything and i guess in this project and in his cycling uh, feats in the 90s there was always a lot of attention paid to a skills as an engineer as a an inventor really and uh, his genius in these in these fields and sometimes i think his athletic ability was was overlooked and this was something i was keen to talk to him about and i think there's one or two fascinating tidbits from him about that um and it makes you maybe perhaps help us all or encourage us all to reassess a breeze career to some extent anyway Without further ado, let's hear from the man himself. Here is Graham O'Brien. Amateur rider from Air in Scotland is now smashing the most coveted record of them all. His radical style, his homemade bicycle. The world hour record is going to fall to Graham O'Brien by the end of this lap. There's no doubt about that now. 
21.596 kilometers. Francesco Moser's record of eight years ago has gone to a rider on a homemade bicycle. Graham, we're meeting in London on the eve of the premiere of Battle Mountain, the film that follows you on a, a long journey, really, a couple of years, um, up to your attempt at the, the world land speed record. Now, you've had a film made about you before, but this one's a bit different because you're in it, um, although you've made a bit of a cameo in the last one as well, The Flying Scotsman. But what do you? what's your verdict on the film? What do you think? What do you feel when you're watching it? Well, the thing about actually being... A, a, bio, a biopic basically with, with the anchor is well three quarters of the film is the anchor itself which is actually going to Battle Mountain to attack the land speed record which turns out to be um, seizing mediocrity from the jaws of absolute disaster which is, is the save a shelf um, world record of head first <laughs> hang on scroll back if you seize mediocrity from disaster that sounds like a uh, qualified success well, it's a qualified success because out of expectation of what we left the shores of Britain with was disastrously bad. And we came away on the last day with a world record. So that was success. But in terms of your original question about um, what I think of the film, it, because I am the subject, I'm so close to the subject, it's like a, pa a painter being like two inches away from a painting and trying to judge their own work or something. It's Especially if it's a self-portrait, maybe. Well, well, absolutely. So I don't have perspective on it. But David has done a splendid job on it. What do you feel watching it then? Um, not in terms of whether you think it's a good film or not. What sort of emotions does it bring up for you? Well, to be honest, when I saw it the last time, I was really keen at the start that the film was only about bikes. But obviously it became more rounded and then more rounded and, uh, and well really that whole past with the whole suicide and me talking in depth about it and everything, that is in the past and I like some point it's going to have to be in the past. So obviously uh, being in the present tense brings it back out for not being in the past but it's a chance to square it away. And the other thing about it is that a lot of people might take strength from it or, or, or get um, identification with it so it's an honest um, a, a very 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 honest I was, I was desperately honest in, uh, on the film to a level perhaps I wouldn't have done if I knew that I wasn't going to be accessed I thought I'll cut that out in editing later on <laughs> but that, that never transpired so it's, it's just abject honesty has remained in the film which is good for the viewer but a wee bit mm, um, because it's it's so close to the bone of of uh, for me, but 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 then should a biopic um, or by yeah uh, you're actually talking in a film or your life and portrayed um, should the subject feel um, at ease with it, totally at ease with it? But that would it have achieved its goal. It, it's 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 all inclusive. It sh should be all inclusive. It's it, it's not an ego trip. Put it that way. So it doesn't almost. It's almost irrelevant what you think of it in a way. That's not what the the film hasn't been made for you. I wondered uh, about you know we know that in the past in your you know earlier cycling career, the cost, the human cost of investing as much as you have done in your your goals and you know you, you talked about when you went for a record how your emotional survival was at stake you talked about that again with regard to the world land speed record but can you compare the two did you feel in a in a better place did you feel that you have a, had a better perspective on this exploit well this exploit was born out of a different remit which was to show that you can actually you can go and do something without waiting for the corporate permission or backing or, or just have have a reason to do something that you want to f for a good reason, which wasn't really for my own reason. Well, it was my own reason to be honest about. Um, I was curious to find out how fast I could go, but it wasn't. I absolutely have to go that fast. Um, the remit was. To, to bring something relevant into the 21st century rather than speaking to young people at schools and and then um, sometimes from, from areas that didn't have an awful lot of maybe hope and an and example t t that they're looking up seeing me 
are reading about me building a bike out of a washing machine and bring, bre- breaking those world records that are really, really relevant world records and world championships. Um, to do something that's hands-on in my own home, maybe not to the degree that, that I could have done had I fielded out to total professionals, but that was a remit to... to this this has got to emulate what somebody could have a vision for and actually do themselves without needing corporate help. Yeah, it's a very Graham O'Brien project. I mean, it, it's almost Charlie uh, Malarby, your manager, said in the film that when it was suggested, he immediately sort of sprang out of his seat and said, "Yes, this is this is perfect for Graham. It, it, it's a perfect um, project for you to really sink your teeth into, using all your engineering and inventing skills as well as your athletic ability." Um, how do you th- there's a, a really beautiful uh, sequence in the film of you riding around some of your local roads in Ayrshire um, the Black Loch and looking across to Arran I think and the snow capped mountains and there's really lovely music and there's a commentary from you there about what it means to you to, to cycle you're describing cycling and, and what it what it brings to you I think we're we're very aware of of as I mentioned earlier the cost that cycling has 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 had for you. But have you always managed to cling on to that enjoyment, almost therapeutic aspect to it? Well, I still do actually. I moved house a couple of years ago to a slightly more inland area near a more hills and beautiful roads, specifically because the roads were there. Um, and I don't own a car. Um, I don't actually wash properly wash unless I've actually been on a bike and got a sweat on well unless I'm in London or something and obviously you don't have the opportunity but in my day to day life I'll go bike ride wash with a sweat on so that's a policy that's my policy but the thing about it is it's that's the point where you're doing it for the now of it my enjoyment of cycling is so much more than it was because I don't have a future performance to look to like before I would go, oh, I actually have to go this hard, I have to improve myself so that at some future point I'm going to do some impressive ride to, to, to me feel good about my achievement and, and maybe to impress other people. Uh, but I don't have that anymore. I'm riding because in this actual moment I want to feel good about, because I enjoy the feel of you know your lungs working and your body working and blood flow and just the exercise of it. I think over the years I've become a wee bit like a retired greyhound or something. You still need to go and run about, or else you just don't feel good. Trotting around the paddock, uh, that's a more a horse than a, than a greyhound. Um, how do you look back then now on your cycling exploits? You know, we see in the film the footage of uh, world, you know, your world pursuit titles, your a record. How do you look back on them now? What do you feel when you see those? Do you look back with pride or with um, mixed emotions because there were some unhappy memories attached to them as well. Well, those records were so at the edge of. If you don't understand our record, it's, it's one of those um, one of those records that, that other great riders, that Tour de France winners, that Eddie Merckx said it took years of his life. It's one of those records that you push yourself the very edge of, of what feels like human survival to do it, and you've got to train like that as well. So the whole psychology of that is pushing yourself to that, that, that point you did. And Graham O'Brien lifting the British national championship record at 4,000 metres, and now Chris Borman is taking him on and losing. And this is something of a surprise. And Graham O'Brien here is on a schedule that could shake the roof off the Viking Ship Stadium because he's heading towards the world record if he can hold on to this pace. And Chris Borman was the world record holder after his ride in Barcelona just one year ago. So the fact that I didn't crumble and I did step up for it again after not getting it the day after, that, that's, that's more or less written my epitaph, not been in, in, in some um, morbid way, but, but really there's nothing bigger than that. So I'm proud of the fact that I did carried on like that and pe- people have taken good um, sort of example and a good way from that goes well you know what you can overcome adversity or th- you can do more than you think you, th- you can so it's been good in that kind of way in terms of so you're, pr- you're proud of how it's inspired other people the legacy of it in terms of what it's meant to other people well actually I didn't actually feel any of that until 2008 it was Nicole who came up the hill in Beijing and, and the women's road race, the first gold medal of that rush. 
before Sir Chris won his three goals and it was the first one and, and I know Nicole is a splendid person and it was like oh, wow because you just that's mine it's like somebody barging into a wedding and goes that's my wedding cake and stick their hand into it that was the nature of her victory and, and I go oh wow and it's like that tear in my eye and I was like wow fact so because people have told me over the years that you know when you won that world championship and it looked as if you wouldn't know you won it and it was like um, or the world air record and it was like wow Graham O'Brien has done it he's beaten the world record just said a few moments ago by Ermin O was, oh, the effect you had on us was, and I couldn't get it until that moment when I felt it myself. So it was only in that period of time I, I, I look back and goes, "Wow, that was amazing that I did." It's almost like somebody else. When I mean, it was all last century, so it was. It seems like a past kind of life, but I'm, I'm proud of 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 not caving and an effect I had on people. Actually, I met up with Nicole and and, and I ended it up. And I was saying, Do you know. There must have been how many million people must have seen you win that gold medal in Beijing, and they thought, "Oh wow, I felt really good for ten minutes." I think that done some a back of envelope calculation. We've made fifteen people ecstatically happy for a lifetime. If you added all the ten minutes up and how long somebody lives, it's like, well, I've done, I've, I've made my fifteen people happy already. And it wasn't until that moment that you realise that because that that well, that's fascinating because it was. A feat at the time, you know, front page of Le Keep. It was an incredible story that really did capture people's imagination. An unknown Scotsman. I mean, you weren't unknown to yourself or your <laughs> your circle, but or you know, in Scotland and in the UK, you were quite well known that on the time traveling scene. But internationally, you were unknown, and you you broke the the our record held by Francesco Moser. I've often thought recently. I don't know how much attention you pay to social media i don't suspect you pay all that much attention but i've often thought now that we live in in a, an age now where a performance like yours then would be treated with suspicion probably in on, in, in, in the social media context um i don't know if that's something you've ever considered it's the way that things are now received and uh, and there's a sort of instant trial by twitter well actually the ironic thing is it was treated with suspicion at the time. The first question I was asked when I got abroad, because I went from through the glass ceiling from the gate and got them down the, the Ayrshire coast on, on races, literally two weeks beforehand, um, getting 20 quid as a rank amateur, skint, um, top British amateur, to getting paid thousands of pounds. Oh, you come to Belgium, I'll be there. But the first thing I was asked was, did you take EPO? And he goes, what, what are we talking about? So at that point, I realised that other people's drug taking was going to very much impinge on my life. So that has been an ongoing theme over the years, which at one point I did have actually a rage on on a, <laughs> on social media. I think it was about, I don't know, about eight years ago. So I put this page up because... I'll put put my, my, my finger into a, a lie detector, you know, I'm not getting tarnished with these people. Um, there was a big rant about it, which I'm still happy to do, but um, it's just unfortunate how that all turned out. I feel that the whole wow, that was that wow factor with Nicole. Mm. I was talking about, and I got that wow factor, because I know, I would stake my own life that Nicole would never do that. So it was instant wow, like that. So there's no, oh well, um... And then you've calculated out in your mind, well, probably, with it, and then it's gone. And that's why people watch the sport, it's that wow factor. It's an investment of time and energy and interest into it. Almost the same investment as, as an orgasm, but a time it's spent to actually get an orgasm. So that moment of wow, and then if, if it's destroyed by a wall, I wonder, then that's, that's the saddest thing about it for the wider public. Well, I was going to say that cycling has become an orgasm-free zone. It's it's like you can't you can't trust yourself to have a, an orgasm watching it. But that that's a a real shame. What do you feel then about um, exceptional performances that we see that are subject to this instant suspicion, skepticism, when they might be legitimate? I mean, how how do you you don't know um, you know as little as any of us which which performances those are and wh- which they aren't. But um, how sad is that for the athlete? And for the and for the public, I mean, I lived through that where the finger of suspicion was pointed at everybody. So, undetectable substances. So you can't um, prove that you hadn't. 
and it's got to go, you know, in almost like a ducking pond scenario. In, in ancient times, people get ducked, and if they drowned, they were innocent. So it's like innocent, to, uh, oh, sorry, guilty until innocent. I, in the performance itself, is like the ducking pond because if you win something, well, there's the evidence. So an outstanding performance itself almost merits suspicion. My policy is I'll take it all in face value. Because if you don't take it all in face value, then there's no point in watching any of it. So innocent till guilty is my policy. And if I see an outstanding performance, it goes, wow, that was really, really outstanding. And, and I'll believe it until, I don't, until it's shown not to be the case. Um, Graham, I was going to ask about sport and mental health. Um, I think I've spoken to you about this before, but is sport helpful or unhelpful in, in regards to maintaining some kind of mental equilibrium? With you, for example, um, do you think you would have had the problems you'd had without sport, or, or did they bring something out that wouldn't perhaps otherwise have come out? Well, I think that obsessional sport activity and, and seeking performance and then greater performance and so hiding behind the need for further performance and, 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 and also the gratification of other people and, and the feel for your own worth that you've achieved some amazing thing is a great way to delay actually dealing with an issues. And as I said before, that I love cycling for the now, but the actual feel of being right in the moment for the, all the right reasons, just beauty and bringing to beautiful places and physically in the now is a great way to actually be at one with the world and, and yourself and, and and just for the pure love of that activity. It might not even be sport. You might like to play guitar or do some other activity that's in the now of it. So, or do nothing at all. You might just want to be in the now. But um, certainly there's... It's two completely polar different ends of a, a spectrum sport and activity for the sake of doing it and doing a sport to then achieve the great things to feel achievement and to impress other people is two very very different things with different um benefits or, or well psychologically one does seem much healthier than the other so therefore is elite sport is it inherently unhealthy psychologically but there, there's a, a big um well, let's put it this way. Um, the cause and effect is very hard to, to tweedle apart because does somebody become a great champion like I did because I'm so desperate in need of that, um, that further, um, I dis, further contentment and discontent and then become discontent with that and I need further contentment. My life is full of continual discontentment because fundamentally there's a hole in me that cannot be filled with enough achievement. You could argue that, that a lot of people are driven by that. So many there's a nuclear reactor driving them on. Because I always say, perfectly balanced, happy people don't go and ride up and down a dual carriageway in a wet Scottish morning, Sunday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, when they could be riding, reading the Sunday newspaper. But on the other hand, it might be their passion. So um, they might genuinely be just into the... might love that and the camaraderie and... So I think it's down to the individual to actually analyse the remit. Why are you actually doing it? Is it to impress people? Or for you to feel, you have to feel that outside force of, 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 of achievement or whatever? Or is it truly what you passionately want to do? I guess there's a subtle difference between hunger and, and desire. You, you hunger is, is, is need to sort of fill this void, that this emptiness that you talk about, whereas desire has more sort of positive connotations reaching towards the goal. Have you met anybody? I'm, I'm thinking of Chris Hoy, who's an elite sportsman who has, maybe he's a good example of somebody who has had a, a healthy or been able to maintain somehow a healthy attitude towards it. What's the secret of that? Well, I know Chris personally, and he's a splendid person, but he is slightly not your average track rider. Now, you were a radio self Richard, and you must know a lot of the short, sharp, sprintery types. Um, maybe the right word isn't to say slightly flighty, but 
as compared to your long distance kind of endurance type psychology, there's a very explosive, very pugnacious element to track sprinting. Now, Chris is is is, is such a nice guy, but he, this is my analysis could be completely wrong. But he seems to have the ability to go from black to white from in terms of being nice and chatty and everything and focus down like everybody else does but it all explodes at that moment and it's needed and then he's back to just being a nice guy so he's not grey like nearly champions are kind of grey they're all oh, revved up for all the time but the real champions focus it when it's absolutely needed and maybe he's one of them so he's able to sort of compartmentalise be able to put, put things in the relevant boxes well, use all his energy for the moment it's needed when actually turning the pedals and actually in that conflictive um, experience by another rider, actually combat, it's a combative experience. So you have to beat that other rider. So at that moment, all your energy of almost like caveman, um, vitriolic um, output of energy and in, 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 in a sporting sense, violence, like, pedal and, 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 and track handling violence to beat that other person comes out and then he's just not that person as soon as he steps off the track, he's a very very, a really nice guy whereas other track riders that I've seen, I've actually seen two track riders with a fork, literally each other's eyeball, arguing over dinner I've seen that in real life and that's the kind of flighty I'm talking about that vitriol, that grey area just carrying on to real life and that must diminish your energy for the real actual moment when it's going to matter. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Graham, you um, you mentioned earlier that you speak at, you've spoken at schools and things like that. Have, have you ever been invited to um, speak to a team, work with athletes, coaching senior athletes, been invited by the Federation, British Cycling Federation or anybody at all to be involved? It, with helping riders at the top level? Well, strangely, I've not. Would you welcome such an approach? But well, it's, been, it's been so not on the cards to happen, I haven't even thought about it. I actually don't know I'd have that much to contribute because I'm more interested... See, how it was was was, was, was very unhealthy for me. So to encourage other people to be that unhealthily focused and make the most of that unhealthiness to, to achieve... What is in effect collateral, um, collateral success is what I would describe my um, sport and successes is collateral. Um, other folk maybe turn to alcoholism or some other thing or, 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 or self-harm or whatever it is. Mine was um, that sport and success is what was going to make me feel okay in the moment or thinking I'm going to achieve it make me feel okay. So I, I don't think that's a great, a great philosophy and certainly in the modern world I've known no want of achievement for the achievement's sake I, I, there's things I want to do not because somebody will be impressed by it or it's a great achievement I might turn out to be that way but the, my, my want of it is just because I want to and, and I could easily give it up without feeling any loss So what's what's next for you? What You've you've you know, you've know you've had a go at the World Land Speed record is, that, is it something you still want to do to find projects to sink your teeth into are you looking for something else or what 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 does the next you know immediate future hold for you actually very little if if the basis of you need to seek more and then more and more from regional level scottish level um british level world level and then winning at world level if that's not enough if you have to seek more at the age of 50 then that just undermines the whole concept that of of doing enough embrace the, the, the idea that I feel I've got more than most people have, even some of the wealthiest people on the planet, and that I feel and believe that I have enough. So you do feel happy? Do you feel quite fulfilled at the moment? I feel content, because happiness comes and goes. See, that's a flighty thing, like a cloud that comes and goes. Um, or sadness, those are all flighty. So, yes, contentment is more important. Let's compare it to the water table. The water table doesn't change very much. It could be sunny for a month, that's like being happy, or it could rain for a month, like being sad, 
and those will come and go, but the water table never changes very much. I'm more concerned about my contentment, my inner contentment, whether things are going good or bad or indifferently. And is is riding your bike part of that? Does that does that help? Does that contribute to that sense of contentment? Well, that's something I enjoy doing, and it takes me into beautiful places. Not because I need to. I don't seek those places in order for me to feel okay, but I generally enjoy doing them. And it's a place of peace, and, and I'm very blessed living in a place um, that that is such beautiful roads and beautiful countryside and, and quiet places, very little traffic. That's specifically moved here because that is a huge part of my life. You're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Just finally, a final question. Um, this is a more vague question, but <laughs> desire, the, the desire, the hunger that you talk about, and, and we know it comes from a sense of unhappiness or emptiness, is it fixed and predetermined? Because it's something that is also desirable in sports people. Can it be, can it be coached? Should it be coached? Should it be used as a powerhouse? My observation is that there's a lot of wastage in sport. And the people that are the wastage tend to be the more content people. And those who rise up through the challenge and, and, and the discomfort of sport. Because it's not easy being a champion or, or, or aspiring to be a champion there's a lot of sacrifices and a lot of effort and a lot of what feels very uncomfortable training exercises and, and, and so it goes and so forth so it's only the most driven people who survive now the cause of somebody to be so driven is could be different for different people so I can only speak for myself for myself it was a very unhealthy one because of worth self worth was the main problem that I had to try to try and fill yourself with is a void you cannot actually fill unless you actually deal with the problem of actually what is the fundamental root of the cause of the void itself which which I feel that I've done so to put it succinctly and in, 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 in what I've actually done is my worth and purpose do not come from external things I always saw an external, an external solution for an internal discord. Whereas now I don't seek anything externally. If I want to seek something externally, like wearing impressive clothes or doing an impressive performance or or or, or, or doing anything that's externally for the reasons to try and fulfil a discontentment in me, then there's something very wrong with the internal. So I need to deal with that internal. But at the moment, I feel. That I've got enough. I've got my own ways, very much my own ways. I feel I go through my, my day and my life that I feel absolutely splendid. I've not had as much as a, an aspirin in three years because I don't need that medication anymore. But there's really, I can go right into it the guts of how I feel okay. I mean, I feel good, good days and bad days that like every other human being, but not that black way that, that I was before. And that's absolutely splendid. Do you, th- an awful lot is, is made these days of the necessity of drive and desire and hunger. And we know, you know, books will tell you that if you practice for 10,000 hours at something, you can be world class at it. That there seems to be a great emphasis being put on, on hard work and this notion that, um, that that is the key. Whether you're Bill Gates or Tiger Woods, you're, you're at the top because you've worked hard on everybody else. Does that ignore innate talent? You know, you clearly were driven. You, you worked hard that when you got up 24s after narrowly missing out on the world air record and broke it. That owed an awful lot to your to your drive and desire. But does it ignore the talent? Are we in danger of overlooking talent and the necessity of talent? Did you ever do a VO2 test, for example? Yes, I did. Actually, down at the... Um the Olympic Centre had a terrible coughing going on, which was related more to the dust at the, the velodrome that we knew. And, the, and it turned out um, it was almost exactly the same as Peter Haney because he saw it. It was, it was Peter that told me, in fact, um, three times world skilling champion. Um, he was saying it was 91 point something. 
your VO2 was 91 point something. Yeah, apparently it was just a smidgen. Him and I were similar, and it was just a smidgen behind Seb Cole, who's the highest measure. So, so Graham, you, you could have been really good without all this pain and, and, and anguish. You had the talent. Well, apparently so. The, the, apparently, contorting your arms and all that was was very little to do with it. Um, but then the riders, that, what matters is my peer group. I used to think it matter what the wild world thinks and everything. You know, there's only maybe a handful of people that actually their opinion matters because the people that actually really, really know how what it takes to be to have done what I did, and the respect that peer group is all the respect you really need. In terms of recognising your talent, you know when you race against somebody what you're up against in terms of their ability to do it or not. Well, yourself, Richard, you were a Commonwealth Games rider. You raced some races that I was in. You know what it takes to be as good as I was. I beat you in the Tour of Trossachs, Graham, in 1998. So you did. That's I, I took a screen grab. <laughs> I didn't have screen grabs on this, but I took a photograph of the of teletext on the TV when it, I think you were you were third and I was second eat my dust yeah, that's that, that's amazing Richard so but the thing is you, you do have I mean, all respect to you you know what you've ever taken a VO2 test Richard? yeah I have yeah I got uh, 78 when I was about 18 you know you could have gone places you should be filled and racked with a great a comeback I am I, but I was too wishy-washy as you told me at the time <laughs> You were just doing, it was a drink talking, Richard. Um, wishy washy. You're right, you're right. I was too wishy washy. I wasn't as, as I didn't have the, the focus that you had or, or Chris Hoy had. I didn't have that. I wasn't prepared to sacrifice everything for that one goal. Now, that means that I didn't achieve as much as I could and should have done. I, I wasn't prepared to sort of gamble everything on this one, put all my money on one horse. My opinion on the whole thing about talent is that there's not a holistic approach taken on. Um, it's all bodily. What bodily could you have achieved? But if you look at a pianist or, or, or some, there's a lot of other sports that require actual um, mental talent, like I don't know, like like snooker or something, and gymnastics, and that actual, you know, there's actual mental capacity to actually the capacity to actually train and push yourself that hard consistently is a talent so I had that talent to do that and you know all of it the, your, your spirit to carry on and your mental capacity to, to, to push yourself that hard is part of the talent I mean here's the, here's the, the point throwing it back to you Richard if my head had been transplanted onto your body when you were 18, there's a good chance you would have been world champion. You're not saying that you weren't capable, but the head, that, that ability to push yourself to that limit of, for whatever reason, whether it's mental illness or just obsessive need or, 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 or terrible demons that you're trying to get away from, then, but nonetheless, it's an interesting thing to ask would my head and your shoulders have made a big difference? Would I have made you that good? Because I made myself that good. I wasn't that good in 1993. I, I thought, I ah, you know, I have to make myself that good. Based on the principle that Francesco Moses got two arms and two legs, and you know what, I've got two arms and two legs, I'll make myself that good. And through absolute, the point of actually the floor coming out and down at me in the training sessions and, and not stopping until actually my eyes are going blacking out. What's, in, what's really interesting about that is that you mentioned the peer group and you know my goals were set according to what was expected in my peer group i compare it to sort of um you know the, the pinnacle of the sport was was everest you know tour de france and professional cycling on the continent but all i could see from my house in edinburgh was arthur's seat and so i didn't focus on everest i focused on arthur's seat which was 251 meters and i didn't because i couldn't see anything bigger than Mount Everest and than, than Arthur's Seat and the Commonwealth Games in cycling terms are Arthur's Seat rather than Everest because I couldn't see anything other than Arthur's Seat that's what I focus on I didn't feel like I had the right or the ability or the um, ambition to believe that I was capable of more than what I could see than what I could relate to well put it another way if Robert Miller hadn't done so well in the Tour de France being King of the Mountains in 1984 
and I mean, such a great road rider from Scotland, you might not even have, have wanted to reach as far as you did. So there is always the pool of somebody showing somebody what can be done, and then everybody else realises it can be done. From our point of view, I realised in 1993 that I was trapped in a catch-22 situation, where a person can't truly believe you can do something until you've done it. Obrey has got it, 4 minutes 20.894, a new world record for Graham Obrey. Philippe Ermino takes the silver medal. That's when you truly, truly believe you can do it, is once you've done it, obviously you can do it. But there's some things you can't achieve until you truly believe you can do them. So you can see the conundrum where you can't achieve it because you don't truly believe it, but you can't believe it until you've truly done it. So I thought I'm breaking out of that, I'm assuming almost like arrogance, you know what? I'm as good as that guy. I'm having it. I'll make myself that good. Jumping the barrier to true belief that I would have had had I broken it, to then go and break it. It's almost like borrowing future success into the present. And also, I think the peer group does play a part. I mean, if you look at the four minute mile, Roger Bannister broke a four minute mile, and it was, it was like, wow, a human being can run a mile in under four minutes. And next thing, there was like 15 runners broke it within a very short period of time because they saw that it could have been done. So there's, the, there's, there's always the example focused. And if you look at the success of British cycling right now, you can't tell me that's all oh, that individual driven want without a directed example ahead of them to follow, almost like a rabbit to chase in terms of success that's been sh- shown that it's possible and, and the way to it. The path has been shown. So there is a belief because the person that, that you are hanging out with has done it. That's got to be an ultimate belief for somebody that maybe you didn't have in your generation. Maybe. Graham, I better let you go. You're off to, what, to, to, to the premiere of the, of the film. I hope it does well for you. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. I hope you enjoyed that chat with the irrepressible, always fascinating and thought-provoking Graham O'Brien. Big thanks to Graham for giving up the time, and a big thanks too to Rafa, as ever, for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. If you want to watch Graham's film, Battle Mountain, um, go to obrie.com. You'll find more information about how to get it there. There's also a website for the film, www.gobattlemountain.com that's gobattlemountain.com and you can buy the DVD through that website as well a little reminder that we have our 11th and final Friends special of 2016 coming out very soon Bradley Wiggins' Full Circle is the title it includes interviews with lots of the people who've been part of Wiggins' career through his Olympic success, his Tour de France victory and everything else besides And of course, it includes some discussion of the recent controversy around his TVs and what, if anything, that means for his legacy. Become a friend if you're not already at thecyclingpodcast.com. We're also launching our Friends Scheme for 2017. It will still be just £10 to gain access to our 11 Friends specials, and we have some crackers planned for next year, I promise. But in response to requests from a few of you, we are giving the opportunity to pay more. I know that sounds crazy, but this is our version of pay what you think it's worth. Our friends help to support the Cycling Podcast work throughout the year, including our coverage of all three Grand Tours. Uh, So if you want to support what we do and support the Cycling Podcast, uh, I think we produced 160 free podcasts this year, 2016, uh, with more than just £10. Now you can, but you don't have to. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com for more information. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pear for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.